Lake was not content to let his first message stand, but had another bulletin written and dispatched across the snow to the camp before Moulton could get back. After that, Moulton stayed at the wireless in one of the planes, transmitting to me, and to the Arkham for relaying to the outside world, the frequent postscripts which Lake sent him by a succession of messengers. Those who followed the newspapers will remember the excitement created among men of science by that afternoon's reports, reports which have finally led, after all these years, to the organisation of that very stark weather moor expedition which I am so anxious to dissuade from its purposes. I had better give the messages literally as Lake sent them, and as our base operator, McTai, translated them from the pencil shorthand. Fowler makes discovery of highest importance in sandstone and limestone fragments from blasts. Several distinct triangular striated prints like those in Archean slate, proving that source survived from over 600 million years ago to Comanchean times without more than moderate morphological changes and decrease in average size. Comanchean prints apparently more primitive or decadent, if anything, than older ones. Emphasize importance of discovery in press. Will mean to biology what Einstein has meant to mathematics and physics. Joins up with my previous work and amplifies conclusions. Appears to indicate, as I suspected, that Earth has seen whole cycle or cycles of organic life before known one that begins with archaeozoic cells was evolved and specialized not later than a thousand million years ago, when planet was young and recently uninhabitable for any life forms or normal protoplasmic structure. Question arises when, where and how development took place. Later, examining certain skeletal fragments of large land and marine saurians and primitive mammals, find singular local wounds or injuries to bony structure not attributable to any known predatory or carnivorous animal of any period of two sorts, straight, penetrant bores, and apparently lacking incisions. One or two cases of cleanly severed bones. Not many specimens affected. I'm sending to camp for electric torches. Will extend search area underground by hacking away stalactites. Still later. Have found peculiar soapstone fragment about six inches across and an inch and a half thick, wholly unlike any visible local formation greenish, but no evidences to place its period, has curious smoothness and regularity, shaped like five-pointed star with tips broken off and signs of other cleavage at inward angles and in centre of surface, small, smooth depression in centre of unbroken surface, arouses much curiosity as to source and weathering, probably some freak of water action. Carroll, with magnifier, thinks he can make out additional markings of geologic significance groups of tiny dots in regular patterns. Dogs growing uneasy as we work, and seem to hate this soapstone. Must see if it has any peculiar odour. We'll report again when Mills gets back with light and we start on underground area. 10.15pm. Important discovery. Orendorf and Watkins, working underground at 9.45 with light, found monstrous barrel-shaped fossil of wholly unknown nature probably vegetable and less overgrown specimen of unknown marine radiata. Tissue evidently preserved by mineral salts. Tough as leather, but astonishing flexibility retained in places. Marks of broken off parts at ends and around sides. Six feet end to end, three and five tenths feet central diameter, tapering to one foot at each end, like a barrel with five bulging ridges in place of staves. Lateral breakages, as of thinnish stalks, are at equator in middle of these ridges. In furrows between ridges are curious growths, combs or wings that fold up and spread out like fans, all greatly damaged but one, which gives almost seven-foot wing spread. Arrangement reminds one of certain monsters of primal myth, especially fabled elder things in Necronomicon. Their wings seem to be membranous, stretched on framework of glandular tubing, apparent minute orifices in frame tubing at wing tips, ends of body shriveled, giving no clue to interior or to what has been broken off there. Must dissect when we get back to camp. Can't decide whether vegetable or animal. Many features, obviously of almost incredible primitiveness, have set all hands cutting stalactites and looking for further specimens. Additional scarred bones found but these must wait. 
having trouble with dogs. They can't endure the new specimen, and would probably tear it to pieces if we didn't keep it at a distance from them. 11.30 p.m. Attention, Dyer, Pabodi, Douglas. Matter of highest, I must say, transcendent importance. Arkham must relay to Kingsport Head Station at once. Strange barrel growth is the archaean thing that left prints in rocks. Mills, Boudreaux and Fowler discover a cluster of thirteen more at underground point forty feet from aperture, mixed with curiously rounded and configured soapstone fragments smaller than one previously found, star-shaped but no marks of breakage except at some of the points. Of organic specimens, eight apparently perfect, with all appendages, have brought all to surface, leading off dogs to distance. They cannot stand the things. Give close attention to description and repeat back for accuracy. Papers must get this right. Objects are eight feet long all over. Six foot, five ridged barrel torso, three and five tenths feet central diameter, one foot end diameters. Dark grey, flexible and infinitely tough. Seven foot membranous wings of same colour, found folded, spread out of furrows between ridges. Wing framework tubular or glandular, of lighter grey with orifices at wing tips. Spread wings have serrated edge. Around equator, one at central apex of each of the five vertical, stave-like ridges, are five systems of light grey flexible arms or tentacles, found tightly folded to torso but expansible to maximum length of over three feet. Like arms of primitive crinoid. Single stalks, three inches diameter, branch after six inches into five sub-stalks, each of which branches after eight inches into small, tapering tentacles or tendrils, giving each stalk a total of twenty-five tentacles. At top of torso, blunt, bulbous neck of lighter grey, with gill-like suggestions, holds yellowish five-pointed starfish-shaped apparent head covered with three-inch wiry cilia of various prismatic colours. Head thick and puffy, about two feet point to point, with three-inch flexible yellowish tubes projecting from each point. Slit in exact centre of top, probably breathing aperture. At end of each tube is spherical expansion where yellowish membrane rolls back on handling to reveal glassy, red irised globe, evidently an eye. Five slightly longer reddish tubes start from inner angles of starfish-shaped head and end in sac-like swellings of same colour which, upon pressure, open to bell-shaped orifices two inches maximum diameter and lined with sharp, white, tooth-like projections, probably mouths. All these tubes, cilia and points of starfish head, found folded tightly down, tubes and points clinging to bulbous neck and torso. Flexibility surprising, despite vast toughness. At bottom of torso, rough but dissimilarly functioning counterparts of head arrangements exist. Bulbous light grey pseudo-neck, without gill suggestions, holds greenish five-pointed starfish arrangement. Tough, muscular arms four feet long and tapering from seven inches diameter at base to about two and five tenths at point. To each point is attached small end of a greenish five-veined membranous triangle eight inches long and six wide at farther end. This is the paddle, fin or pseudo foot, which has made prints in rocks from a thousand million to fifty or sixty million years old. From inner angles of starfish arrangement project two foot reddish tubes tapering from three inches diameter at base to one at tip, orifices at tips. All these parts infinitely tough and leathery, but extremely flexible. Four-foot arms with paddles undoubtedly used for locomotion of some sort, marine or otherwise. When moved, display suggestions of exaggerated muscularity. As found, all these projections tightly folded over pseudoneck and end of torso, corresponding to projections at other end. Cannot yet assign positively to animal or vegetable kingdom, but odds now favour animal. Probably represents incredibly advanced evolution of radiata without loss of certain primitive features. Echinoderm resemblances unmistakable despite local contradictory evidences. Wing structure puzzles in view of probable marine habitat, but may have use in water navigation. Symmetry is curiously vegetable-like, suggesting vegetables essential up and down structure rather than animals fore and aft structure. Fabulously early date of evolution preceding even simplest archaean protozoa hitherto known, baffles all conjecture as to origin. Complete specimens have such uncanny resemblance to certain creatures of primal myth that suggestion of ancient existence outside Antarctic becomes inevitable. Dyer and Pabodi have read Necronomicon, 
and seen Clark Ashton Smith's nightmare paintings based on text, and will understand when I speak of elder things, supposed to have created all earth life, as jest or mistake. Students have always thought conception formed from morbid imaginative treatment of very ancient tropical radiata. Also, like prehistoric folklore things Wilmarth has spoken of. Cthulhu cult appendages, etc. Vast field of study opened. Deposits probably of late Cretaceous or early Eocene period, judging from associated specimens. Massive stalagmites deposited above them. Hard work hewing out, but toughness prevented damage. State of preservation miraculous, evidently owing to limestone action. No more found so far, but will resume search later. Job now to get fourteen huge specimens to camp without dogs, which bark furiously and can't be trusted near them. With nine men, three left to guard the dogs, we ought to manage the three sledges fairly well, though wind is bad. Must establish plain communication with McMurdo Sound and begin shipping material. But I've got to dissect one of these things before we take any rest. Wish I had a real laboratory here. Dyer better kick himself for having tried to stop my westward trip. First the world's greatest mountains, and then this. If this last isn't the high spot of the expedition, I don't know what is. We're made scientifically. Congrats, Pabodi, on the drill that opened up the cave. Now will Arkham please repeat description? The sensations of Pabodi and myself at receipt of this report were almost beyond description, nor were our companions much behind us in enthusiasm. McTie, who had hastily translated a few high spots as they came from the droning receiving set, wrote out the entire message from his shorthand version as soon as Lake's operator signed off. All appreciated the epoch-making significance of the discovery, and I sent Lake congratulations as soon as the Arkham's operator had repeated back the descriptive parts as requested, and my example was followed by Sherman from his station at the McMurdo Sound supply cache, as well as by Captain Douglas of the Arkham. Later, as head of the expedition, I added some remarks to be relayed through the Arkham to the outside world. Of course, rest was an absurd thought amidst this excitement, and my only wish was to get to Lake's camp as quickly as I could. It disappointed me when he sent word that a rising mountain gale made early aerial travel impossible. But within an hour and a half, interest again rose to banish disappointment. Lake, sending more messages, told of the completely successful transportation of the fourteen great specimens to the camp. It had been a hard pull, for the things were surprisingly heavy, but nine men had accomplished it very neatly. Now some of the party were hurriedly building a snow corral at a safe distance from the camp, to which the dogs could be brought for greater convenience in feeding. The specimens were laid out on the hard snow near the camp, save for one on which Lake was making crude attempts at dissection. This dissection seemed to be a greater task than had been expected, for despite the heat of a gasoline stove in the newly raised laboratory tent, the deceptively flexible tissues of the chosen specimen, a powerful and intact one, lost nothing of their more than leathery toughness. Lake was puzzled as to how he might make the requisite incisions without violence destructive enough to upset all the structural niceties he was looking for. He had, it is true, seven more perfect specimens, but these were too few to use up recklessly unless the cave might later yield an unlimited supply. Accordingly, he removed the specimen and dragged in one which, though having remnants of the starfish arrangements at both ends, was badly crushed and partly disrupted along one of the great torso furrows. Results, quickly reported over the wireless, were baffling and provocative indeed. Nothing like delicacy or accuracy was possible with instruments hardly able to cut the anomalous tissue, but the little that was achieved left us all awed and bewildered. Existing biology would have to be wholly revised, for this thing was no product of any cell growth science knows about. There had been scarcely any mineral replacement, and despite an age of perhaps forty million years, the internal organs were wholly intact. The leathery, undeteriorative, and almost indestructible quality was an inherent attribute of the thing's form of organization, and pertained to some Paleogean cycle of invertebrate evolution utterly beyond our powers of speculation. At first all that lake found was dry, but as the heated tent produced its thawing effect, organic moisture of pungent and offensive odour was encountered toward the thing's uninjured side. It was not blood, but a thick, dark green fluid apparently answering the same purpose. 
By the time Lake reached this stage, all thirty-seven dogs had been brought to the still uncompleted corral near the camp, and even at that distance set up a savage barking and show of restlessness at the acrid, diffusive smell. Far from helping to place the strange entity, this provisional dissection merely deepened its mystery. All guesses about its external members had been correct, and on the evidence of these one could hardly hesitate to call the thing animal. But internal inspection brought up so many vegetable evidences that Lake was left hopelessly at sea. It had digestion and circulation, and eliminated waste matter through the reddish tubes of its starfish-shaped base. Cursorily, one would say that its respiration apparatus handled oxygen rather than carbon dioxide, and there were odd evidences of air storage chambers and methods of shifting respiration from the external orifice to at least two other fully developed breathing systems, gills and pores. Clearly it was amphibian, and probably adapted to long airless hibernation periods as well. Vocal organs seemed present in connection with the main respiratory system, but they presented anomalies beyond immediate solution. Articulate speech, in the sense of syllable utterance, seemed barely conceivable, but musical piping notes covering a wide range were highly probable. The muscular system was almost prematurely developed. The nervous system was so complex and highly developed as to leave Lake aghast. Though excessively primitive and archaic in some respects, the thing had a set of ganglial centers and connectives arguing the very extremes of specialized development. Its five-lobed brain was surprisingly advanced, and there were signs of a sensory equipment, served in part through the wiry cilia of the head, involving factors alien to any other terrestrial organism. Probably it has more than five senses, so that its habits could not be predicted from any existing analogy. It must, Lake thought, have been a creature of keen sensitiveness and delicately differentiated functions in its primal world, much like the ants and bees of today. It reproduced like the vegetable cryptogams, especially the pteridophyta, having spore cases at the tips of the wings and evidently developing from a thallus or prothallus. But to give it a name at this stage was mere folly. It looked like a radiate, but was clearly something more. It was partly vegetable, but had three-fourths of the essentials of animal structure. That it was marine in origin, its symmetrical contour and certain other attributes clearly indicated. Yet one could not be exact as to the limit of its later adaptations. The wings, after all, held a persistent suggestion of the aerial. How it could have undergone its tremendously complex evolution on a newborn earth in time to live prints in Archaean rocks was so far beyond conception as to make Lake whimsically recall the primal myths about great old ones who filtered down from the stars and concocted earth life as a joke or mistake, and the wild tales of cosmic hill things from outside told by a folklorist colleague in Miskatonic's English department. Naturally, he considered the possibility of the Precambrian prints having been made by a less evolved ancestor of the present specimens, but quickly rejected this too facile theory upon considering the advanced structural qualities of the older fossils. If anything, the later contours showed decadence rather than higher evolution. The size of the pseudofeet had decreased, and the whole morphology seemed coarsened and simplified. Moreover, the nerves and organs just examined held singular suggestions of retrogression from forms still more complex. Atrophied and vestigial parts were surprisingly prevalent. Altogether, little could be said to have been solved, and Lake fell back on mythology for a provisional name, jocosely jabbing his finds, the Elder Ones. At about 2.30 a.m., having decided to postpone further work and get a little rest, he covered the dissected organism with a tarpaulin, emerged from the laboratory tent, and studied the intact specimens with renewed interest. The ceaseless Antarctic sun had begun to limber up their tissues a trifle, so that the head points and tubes of two or three showed signs of unfolding. But Lake did not believe there was any danger of immediate decomposition in the almost sub-zero air. He did, however, move all the undissected specimens close together and throw a spare tent over them in order to keep off the direct solar rays. That would also help to keep their possible scent away from the dogs, whose hostile unrest was really becoming a problem, even at their substantial distance and behind the higher and higher snow walls which an increased quota of the men were hastening to raise around their quarters. He had to weight down the corners of the tent cloth with heavy blocks of snow to hold it in place amidst the rising gale, for the Titan Mountains seemed about to deliver some gravely severe blasts. 
Early apprehensions about sudden Antarctic winds were revived, and under Atwood's supervision precautions were taken to bank the tents, new dog corral, and crude aeroplane shelters with snow on the mountainwood side. These latter shelters, begun with hard snow blocks during odd moments, were by no means as high as they should have been, and Lake finally detached all hands from other tasks to work on them. It was after four when Lake at last prepared to sign off, and advised us all to share the rest period his outfit would take when the shelter walls were a little higher. He held some friendly chat with Pabodi over the ether, and repeated his praise of the really marvellous drills that had helped him make his discovery. Atwood also sent greetings and praises. I gave Lake a warm word of congratulations, owning up that he was right about the western trip, and we all agreed to get in touch by wireless at ten in the morning. If the gale was then over, Lake would send a plane for the party at my base. Just before retiring, I dispatched a final message to the Arkham, with instructions about toning down the daily news for the outside world, since the full details seemed radical enough to rouse a wave of incredulity until further substantiated.